In this video, I'm going to go over a lot of the frequent beginner problems of running a CNC. Hey guys, it's Ben with Myers Woodshop. The first thing I want to go over is software. So I'm going to use the whiteboard for this to try to explain the differences between G-code and your design software. So on this, I'm going to be using the Shapoko design software. This is going to be very similar for any other CNC. You're going to have something that drives the machine and then you're going to have a design software to create the file. So on, on our uh, side for Shapoko, we're using Carbide Create and Carbide Motion. They are two different programs. Carbide Create, if you think about the last name in that word, Create, that is our design software because we're designing something, we're creating the file. So create and design. That does not make the machine move or cut or anything like that. If you look over on the other side, we have Carbide Motion. And then again, the last word in the name is telling you what it is. Motion controls or moves the CNC. So once we make our design and we take that design file and put it into Carbide Motion, that will then start cutting out our material. So on the left, on Carbide Create, our design, the extension for these, the um, file extension, so you're going to create a file, let's say you're making a star, and it's going to be called star dot something. Usually like a, a picture file is a dot JPEG, or um, a PDF is a dot PDF. So our Carbide Create file, the design file, is a dot C2D. That contains toolpaths. So it's going to have our design and it's going to have the paths where the machine will cut, the tool actually will move along the path. So you'll have both sets of information. Now there is another way to save this and it's called a dot SVG. And in the SVG, it has only the design file. It will not have the toolpaths. It doesn't carry that information. So for instance, if you buy my wasteboard files or any of my files on my Etsy shop and you're going to cut them yourselves, if you have Carbide Create, you want to load the .c2d because that will contain the file uh, lines and it will also contain the toolpaths telling the machine where to go. If you're using something like vCarve or um, the xCarve software, you're going to use the .svg because C2D is only for Carbide Create and will not load in anything else. So you use the SVG, that will have the design, but it will not have the toolpaths. They will not show up, so you will have to create them yourselves. So if you're buying my files, you download Carbide Create and open the .c2d in Carbide Create. Now that .c2d will not, will not open in Carbide Motion. If you open Carbide Motion and you click open file and you're using the, the .c2d or the .svg, either one, and you try to open it in the motion controller, so opening those in Carbide Motion will say bad code in the G-code, bad characters in the G-code. That's because it's not a Carbide Motion file. It is not a G-code file. We actually have to save what we open over here separately as a G-code file. What does Carbide Motion or any other sender open? Well, for Carbide Motion, it's an extension at the end of whatever it is. So if we made star.c2d over here and we saved it in G-code, it'd be star.nc. And then nc is a G-code file. It will only open in Carbide Motion. So if we try to load the .nc into Carbide Create, we would get nothing. Nothing would show up. Again, all my files are Carbide Create and Design files. They are not a G-code file, so you have to create that yourself. I did that because you may want to edit this, or if you have a different machine other than Shapoko, you need to make it a different size. You have this, and it's not something uneditable. So down here on Carbide Create, we have save the file, the create file, the .c2d, versus save the G code. So saving the file, we want to save the file so we can edit that later. We can design it and change the design or something like that. If we don't save the design file and we only save the G code and then close Carbide Create, 
we cannot go back and open this again and manipulate the file. So we always want to save it twice. We want to save in the upper left hand side the carbide create file. We should be making a .c2d or we can export now as a .svg. Verse, and also we want to save the G code so we can cut something out in carbide motion. So that will be on the toolpaths page and after we create toolpaths at the bottom it will say save G code or if you're plugged in your machine it could say send to carbide motion. I don't like to do that. I like to save the G code for because if something goes wrong and we only send it to the machine and we don't save the G code and let's say that the machine turns off for some reason or something like that, our G code is lost. So I always save the G code to my computer. Now we have open verse import. Very, very important. Open will be opening the carbide create.c2d with all the tool paths and everything. If we click on the import button, we will open maybe a a picture file or an SVG and that will open with them with the design but it will not show the toolpaths. So there are two different open and import. A lot of people mistake the import for an open button. It is not the same. They are different. And on the bottom of our settings page in Carbide Create, we're going to have setting the machine. You're going to have a drop down and it's going to select the Nomad, the Shapeco 3, the XL and the XXL. That will tell Carbide Create how big your wasteboard is, how big of a design file you can use. If you don't have a Shapeco, just use the XXL. That's the biggest we can go and that will be just fine. So that's what setting machine in Carbide Create does. It gives the, uh, the design file how big you can make your design. And finally, at the bottom of Carbide Create, we have tool libraries. That is in the config file in settings. If for some reason you want to take, you make a nice tool library, you add your own and you want to put that on a different computer or your computer crashes and you need to save it again, we can find the .ini file and save that somewhere. And once we load Carbide Create again, we can just copy that over and it will bring in all of our um, tool libraries that we put into the machine that didn't come with it. So over on Carbide Motion, we have some settings that are atypical and you usually wouldn't click, but some people ask what it is. First thing is open log. If we click that, it will open a uh, internet browser and it will show what G code is being sent to the machine. A lot of times it'll be uh, the same thing over and over when it's sitting idle. Most of the times you're not going to, 99% of the time you are not going to need to know that. But one thing that a lot of people get confused with is a setting over there called setting machine. It's a drop down very similar to Carbide Create in the design file and it says Shapeco, Shapeco XXL, Shapeco XL and sometimes Nomad if you plug the Nomad in. And it will always default every time you open to showing that just Shapeco. Not, let's say I have a Shapeco 3 and I turn it on the second time after I set XXL, it will show Shapeco again. As long as you set it the first time, it will send that to the motherboard, the control board on the Shapeco or machine you're using. It will stay that way, even if it says a different thing the second time you open it. So set it once and you never have to set it again. So that's important. Even if it shows something else, just click whatever machine you have, set it one time, and you are good. So last on this whiteboard I have is losing connection. A lot of people lose connection while they're running, running an operation. And I'm going to give you some simple things that are probably 95% of the time this is what's going on. So you're, you're tethered to a computer when you're running G-code for the Shapeco. And one of the things that happens is that the computer goes to sleep. Uh, it is the default settings in Windows. I'm not sure about Mac, but it's probably the same. I don't use a Mac. Um, but the computer, after a certain amount of time sitting idle, will go to sleep. Usually it's maybe 20 minutes, 25 minutes. So if your design file is going for 30 minutes or longer, and you don't touch your computer after you hit send and start cutting, at that 25 minutes the computer will sleep, it will stop sending the file over, and your machine will just stop altogether. 
Also, the USB sleep. That is a separate sleep in the computer. So you want to check both of those, USB sleep, computer sleep. When I have my computer plugged into an outlet, which is how I run my Shapoko at the same time, my CNC, I have it to never sleep for either one of these. I manually turn it off. It won't harm your computer at all. So you can have the display sleep. That's fine, the display go blank. As long as you don't have your computer or USB sleep, you won't lose connection. Uh, the last thing that I'm gonna say about the con losing connection has to do with a vacuum. A lot of people have the vacuum and the Shapoko and the router or spindle all on the same outlet, and that will interfere with the electronics. I try to have my vacuum on a separate breaker and my Shapoko and router on a separate breaker. If you could break all three of those up, that'd be even better, at least not in the same outlet. So that will stop the electronic interference that may occur. And we also have the vacuum not being grounded. If your machine is cutting and it's stopping and losing connection, and you've checked all these others and you have a vacuum, try running it without the vacuum. If it works without the vacuum, it means there's static electricity being built up and your vacuum is sending that static electricity to the electronics and it's turning off. So you wanna use a grounding wire through your vacuum to stop that static electricity. So that is the software side of the most common mistakes that I'm hit with. If any of this doesn't make sense, leave a comment below and I'll try to explain it further. So let's go over to the machine and I'll show you some common mistakes on the machine that will help you in your CNC. So I wanna talk about the belts that we have and eccentric nuts. So over here we have a belt here on the Y, that's Y1. This is the X axis belt. We have a belt over here, that's Y2. And then we have one in here that's driving the Z axis up and down. Now a lot of people have these to where they're not tight enough. You can see my finger. You want it like a guitar string. You want all of them to be a guitar string. Now, if you don't have them tight like a guitar string or you only have one tight, uh, a good test to do is a circle because that's gonna be using all of the belts at the same time. And if your circle is not a circle, your belts are not tight enough. Now in conjunction with that, we have something called an eccentric nut. And we have those over here on this side. Let me zoom in. So we have these wheels. There's four wheels on plate on this plate. It's got a matching plate on the other side, and then the Z-axis has these four wheels. Any rail that has a slider will have these wheels. Now you can see on the top, there's no nut here, but on the bottom here and over here, there are nuts. They are eccentric. So if we tighten them, this wheel will move up and down, and we want that to pinch onto this rail. So if for some reason your belts are tight and still your things aren't coming out well, Make sure that these are pinched and your wheels don't spin when you push them, but all four wheels do ride along that rail and move as you move the machine back and forth. So we have two eccentric nuts down here. We have an eccentric nut here and on the other side of the Z moving up and down. We also have some inside because we have two rails inside there that it goes up and down on, so we have to get those tight. And then we have the two down here. So make sure all your eccentric nuts are tight and they are riding along the rail. Um, you'll probably wanna take this off when you're working with this in here. It'll make it a whole lot easier. Now remember, there is a belt in here that moves up and down, and down on the below uh, of the area, there is a pulley with a nut, and that pulley and nut can move up and down and that's how you tighten it. There's a screw in there, a set screw, that will tighten down this way and push that pulley down and tighten that belt. On this machine, you have an overlapping belt, and you can see that my belt inside there is smooth on the top and smooth underneath. You want the channels to grip each other, and that will help with that, that belt slide so it won't come loose and move. So you wanna make sure this is nice and tight so it won't come undone. So that's the most common machine items that are usually a mistake by new users. One final thing is that this drag chain 
A lot of people find it to be falling off a ton or the tape not sticking. What I've done is I removed the tape altogether, I drilled a hole and I tapped a screw right here with this whole uh, Z axis moved over so I knew it wouldn't interfere and I screwed it right down right here and that way it doesn't go anywhere. It may fall off the back which isn't a big deal, you can still put some tape to help it but as long as you tap a screw that the chain will stay on. All right, so let's talk about one thing that happens a lot, especially with my wasteboard, as it's going to drill the holes. Now, I've designed all my files to use the bit that comes with the Shape Hoko. It's a 201. It is a quarter inch bit. It is larger than recommended for when you drill holes. You really want something about half the size of the hole. So an eighth inch bit is better if you know how to program that. But I've designed everything for beginners, so you just plug it in and go. And because of that, there's... There's a lot of waste that wants to come out, but the bit is so big that not a lot of waste comes out. So when it is coming down like this and plunging, there's a lot of force doing uh, happening when it's plunging. And if you don't have your belts tight, that force will really put strain on the belt and make a tooth slip. Let me explain what that is. So behind our router and that plate, so behind your router and the router plate that moves up and down, we're looking at that view that's actually got a motor up top and a pulley down below and there's a belt that goes around and rotates and that's how it raises and lowers. And with that force, this belt is really being um, pushed hard. And if you look at the pulley over here, this is kind of the side view that I've drawn. It's got teeth on it and the belt has slots which are teeth as well and those ride in each other. So when this is spinning really hard and the belt has any kind of slack it's going to skip teeth. So when you're drilling holes a lot of times this happens with new users is they'll start out and it'll drill the first hole here let's say it's an inch deep and it'll drill an inch deep but because of that pressure and the belt not being tight enough it skips, let's say it skips one tooth, and let's say one tooth equals an eighth of an inch. So the next hole will be seven eighths inch deep, not one because we skipped a tooth. It skipped and it didn't move down every tooth. And it's going to skip another tooth. So the next hole will be six eighths. And the next hole it's going to skip another tooth, so it'll go down five eighths, and you'll progressively have shallower and shallower holes. And that's what's happening. That's why it's very important to have every belt very tight. Uh, about the tightness of a guitar string, if you pluck it, it'll go twing. And if you're skipping, uh, skipping teeth or your holes are getting shallower and shallower as you go on, it's because this belt is not tight enough and it needs to be much tighter so it doesn't skip teeth. So you can skip also to a smaller bit. If you're using a quarter inch, skip to an eighth inch, go down, and it'll allow more of the waste material to come out and less force has to be applied to go through the holes. So hopefully this explains why you lose some plunge depth over time. Your belt isn't tight enough. I hope this video helped you. If it has, please give a thumbs up. And if you have any questions or comments or anything that I haven't answered, leave them in the comments down below and I will answer what I can. Also, check out my website, www.myerswoodshop.com. I have a whole lot of stuff on my blog for the CNC, like bits, feeds, and speeds. I hope this one helped you. Happy cutting.